Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. This is the type of detail that can get lost in a month of wildfires, political fires, and Olympics coverage. But that doesn't mean it's not a huge deal. Coal power is now a thing of the past in Alberta. It happened over the weekend when the Genesee plant here west of Edmonton completed its conversion to natural gas. If I had asked you to name a province that phased out coal years earlier than expected, Alberta would probably not have been your first choice. But if Canada's leading fossil fuel province can do this, it raises a good question. What else could Alberta and the rest of the country do if we were all pulling in the same direction. After all, in any smart long-term climate plan, phasing out oil and gas comes right after coal. So how are we preparing for that transition? Canada is a country and Alberta a province that relies more on oil and gas to keep its economy afloat than all but a handful of other places around the world. So what can we learn about how Alberta beat its coal timeline that could help us with that next transition? How did the province manage to blunt the economic impact of the switch? And just how long do we have to learn these lessons before it's too late? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Arno Kopechki is an environmental journalist and author in Vancouver, B.C. Uh, He recently examined uh, what is a shift in the fossil fuel department, Arno. We're going to talk about that today. Thanks, Jordan. That's right. Yeah, well, it started in June when the headline came out of Alberta. Tell me about that headline. You wrote about how Alberta has had, uh, to be fair, a, a very busy couple of months, but there was one headline that almost got ignored. What was it? Yeah, there's lots of lots of headlines, even just out of Alberta. But uh, Alberta's coal power era comes to an end was the one that grabbed my eyes. And I think it could not be celebrated enough. Why is that final phase out, particularly for Alberta, um, so significant? Well, it is the biggest emissions reduction success in Canadian history. Wow. So Alberta announced their phase-out plan in 2015 when the NDP took power at that time. And they said, we're going to phase coal out uh, by 2030. So at that time, they thought we maybe we can do it in 15 years. At that time, Alberta relied on coal for over half of the electricity that the province used. Wow. Uh, they were burning more coal than ever before in their history, even though... Proportionally, it was a bit less of the mix, but in absolute terms, they, Alberta was burning more coal than, than they ever had. It was earning $3 billion a year in revenue, 3,000 jobs in over 20 communities, and it was producing 59% of, of Canada's electricity emissions in the process. So the, the, the idea of just eliminating that in 15 years struck many as sort of ludicrous. And not only did they do it, but they did it six years ahead of schedule. So it's just an unbelievably rare success story in the world of climate and power and electricity and emissions. I'm so happy that we get to talk about a good news climate story, even if it has uh, broader implications for the policy that we're not implementing now. But before we get to the broader elimination of fossil fuels, take me back to 2015. You mentioned uh, the reaction was that it was ludicrous. What were some of the concerns people had and and what were they saying? Sure. Well, Jason Kenney at that time was was leading the opposition and he called it a, a reckless attack on Alberta's economy. I think he actually called it an assault and he thought it would cost Alberta taxpayers tens of billions of dollars. And thought that it would, you know, potentially leave Albertans, you know, freezing in the cold and on and on. And that was representative of a huge swath of industrial and conservative political interests. And of course, you know, coal country, there's communities all throughout Alberta who who have relied on coal for for generations. Mm-hmm. And so all of these vested interests were, were really freaking out. And they thought, you know, it, it's just hippie pie in the sky thinking that you what are you going to do? The, the establishment position was really that there's no way that this is even possible, 
let alone desirable. But the NDP proved them all wrong. How exactly did they do that six years ahead of schedule? Like what had to occur for that to happen? And and were there any of the ramifications that Kenny and others were afraid of? I mean, particularly in terms of like job losses or, or, or the economy. The short answer I would say is not really. None of those horrific scenarios came to play. The way that Alberta did it was they put a price on carbon. <laughs> they used the proceeds to pay coal producers uh, about $1.4 billion to transition. And the coal producers happily took that money. And in Alberta's case, they basically replaced the coal with natural gas. And that turned out to be a very smooth, easy process for all. Jason Kenney took power in 2019. He campaigned. He wanted to stop this. He thought it was crazy. But, But when he took power... By then, already the coal producers themselves were like, no, thanks. Uh, We really liked that $1.4 billion contract. Uh, We're going (laughs) to stick to the plan here. So what the conservatives did instead, they're like, "Okay, well, we'll we'll carry on with the switch, but we'll just revoke the money, cancel the money that the NDP had also put in place. They had spent hundreds of millions of dollars to help these coal communities transition off of coal and find other jobs and all those things. So that money got taken away from these communities. You know, there were real losses. I don't want to be glib or or downplay uh, the impact on on some of these coal-dependent communities. There were job losses. It was a heavy hit. The NDP had put a plan and money on the table to help them deal with that, and that was what the Conservatives took away. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this is because in your walrus piece, you kind of drew a line between uh, the way Alberta was able to do this so successfully and so quickly and the larger implications for what Canada needs to prepare for uh, in terms of what it means when our most fossil fuel dependent province is able to accomplish something like this. Like when you saw this and you see the overall trends in fossil fuel consumption, what are you thinking? Yes. I mean, immediately my mind goes to the other fossil fuel, which is oil, which Canada is just as dependent on, many times greater actually, than Alberta was dependent on coal. And so to me, Alberta's getting off of coal really feels like a parable and a hopeful one in many ways, but also it contains a huge warning. And I kind of think of it as, as the canary in the oil patch, because it's hard to believe, but the world is actually moving away from oil quite rapidly. And so what are the lessons that we can draw from what happened in Alberta with coal? Can we do something similar in terms of transitioning off of oil as well? When you say the world is moving away from oil and even somewhat quickly, I guess, um, how do economists and experts measure that? And what are they saying about uh, the kind of time frame that we're looking at? Right. I don't want to overstate too many things here, but it is not me. It is people like the International Energy Agency, BP, McKinsey, basically everybody who's not a massive oil company or conglomerate, but even some of them like BP are saying that the world is going to peak its oil production sometime in the next five years or so. We are really rapidly approaching that peak. And That obviously has huge implications for the world's fourth largest oil producing nation, which is us. The oil we produce is mostly bitumen, heavy oil, the most expensive oil to produce. And we export about 80% of the oil that we produce. Hmm. So we are just immensely vulnerable to fluctuations in the world's use of oil and, and global trends. This is not something that is under our control. We depend on foreign markets buying our oil. Everybody knows, I think, that uh, Alberta's entire economy basically depends on oil. Um, Can you uh, explain to us the extent that Canada as a whole um, depends on oil for our economy? It's not just Alberta's uh, growth at stake here. It is not just Alberta. Of course, Alberta is the most dependent, but Look, oil is Canada's biggest export by almost an order of magnitude. We we exported $123 billion worth of oil in 2022. The next up was cars, which is related to oil. And we exported $33 billion worth of that. This generated about $33 billion in revenues for governments throughout the country. 
There are 150,000 directly employed jobs uh, from the oil industry. That's not counting knockoff, which goes much further. Mm. If it's not the backbone of our economy, it is certainly a vital organ of our economy. And uh, so again, just we are immensely vulnerable to a downturn. Uh, and I'm not talking about you know the end of oil, but even just a little whisper of a fluctuation. Right. You know, if oil drops below seventy dollars a barrel, then suddenly Alberta's economy definitely tanks. And if it goes much further than that, then Canada really starts to shiver as well. Lots of politicians uh, discuss transitioning away from oil. I mean, we had the prime minister on this podcast a few months ago, uh, and he was obviously very positive about making a transition to uh, green jobs. But I guess my question is like, are we actually doing that work? Are we ready for it? Uh, I would say no. I think the liberal government under Trudeau has definitely said a lot of the right things. Right. And I want to extend them a lot of sympathy for the the political and and cultural headwinds that they're up against. Oil production falls under provincial jurisdiction. So there is kind of nothing that the federal government can do to force Alberta to produce less oil. What they can do is is impose an emissions cap, uh, which they have been unfortunately very reluctant to do. Uh, They've been promising that cap forever. I think they should just do it, but they face all kinds of bloody murder and screaming from Alberta and from Pierre Polyev, from the Conservatives. Look at what's going on with the carbon tax. You know, I, again, I give the federal government credit for imposing a, a national price on carbon with immense political sacrifice. I mean, it's going to cost them the next election, probably, right. more than any other single issue. I have to say, in spite of all the goodness that they're doing, nothing really compares to the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, which cost them $34 billion in the end, I believe the number is. Mm-hmm. And that pipeline has single-handedly unleashed the world's single greatest expansion in oil production, about 500,000 barrels a day. The oil sands are going to expand their production by that much just because of this one pipeline. And that really overshadows any of the other measures that uh, the federal government has, has made. In terms of the decision to invest in that pipeline and to continue to invest in fossil fuels, I guess I'll ask this from a devil's advocate point of view. This is not the first time I've heard the term peak oil. You know, this is something that had been discussed. I I remember it being discussed when I was uh, an idealistic kid in university, when I was a little cub reporter. and, And now I'm old and it's coming in the next five years. Like, how do we know? You and me both, Jordan. Yes, reports of oil's death have been greatly exaggerated for decades. I mean... Going back to when Jimmy Carter was in the White House, OPEC at that point had cut America off their Middle Eastern oil. There was an emergency then. They thought, oh, my God, this is this is the end of the oil age. Jimmy Carter put uh, solar panels on the White House, right. quickly got voted out of office, and they, they ripped off the solar panels, and uh, everything was back to usual very quickly. Then again, in, in early 2000s, for various reasons, the price of oil shot past $100 a barrel for the first time in history. And that's when the phrase peak oil in the early 2000s really took off. And people thought, oh, my God, if oil's this expensive, it means we're running out. And then right away, the U.S. discovered fracking and they fracked for oil. And suddenly the scarcity of oil became a glut of oil and the world was just awash in more oil than ever. And then again, with the pandemic, uh, there was a brief but very pronounced dip in global oil consumption. And a lot of people, including the International Energy Agency, said, well, this is it. You know, we've we've hit the turning point and now global oil consumption is going to go down from here on in. And sure enough, as soon as the pandemic was over, now we're back to producing and consuming more oil than ever before. The last two or three years have just been banner years for the oil industry. And as a result of those insane profits and all of that consumption, the world is producing and consuming more oil than ever. Oil producers are expanding operations. So it's hard to imagine in the glare of this really historic boom of oil that at the same time, we are hitting a turning point. And the thing that is different now than before is that alternatives are available that were never available before. Give us a sense of how those alternatives now compare to oil and and how they will progress over the next five, 10 years. Through 
uh, economies of scale and technology, the price of solar power and wind have dropped so dramatically over the last 10 years. You know, solar power is now the cheapest form of electricity on Earth. Uh, wind power is not far behind. So we're, we've approached all of these tipping points now. Renewables are going to surpass fossil fuels as the world's greatest source of electricity in 2025. And that matters because you need clean renewable energy to power electric vehicles. About a quarter of the world's population now is under governments that have mandated 100% electric vehicle production by 2035. Now, vehicles and transport account for about half of oil consumption. So this is what's coming down the pipe as the world electrifies onto clean electricity and gets onto, onto electric vehicles you're going to just see demand for oil crater Mm -hmm. at the very same time as production explodes. So we're really approaching some really interesting things uh, in that sense. We're hitting all of these turning points all at once. And so I kind of see it as a race of colliding tipping points where, you know, oil production is exploding on the one hand, but also renewable energy is exploding even faster. And that's going to create some really crazy volatile dynamics. Sure. I'm not going to pretend to know the specifics or the answers of exactly how that's going to play out, but it is going to be a wild ride. If we are not necessarily preparing to really phase out fossil fuels, um, what are we doing, if anything, to manage the transition towards renewables? Are we ramping those up and taking advantage of what could be those tipping points? Well, uh, you could look to Alberta, which was doing that. And thanks again to the NDP's brief four years in power, they set in place all kinds of subsidies and very attractive uh, policies to attract renewable energy. And Alberta became Canada's leading province for renewable power, uh, solar and wind. It's, uh, Alberta has an incredibly friendly regime for that physical regime. There's a lot of sun and a lot of wind throughout Alberta. Um, But then Danielle Smith, as everybody probably knows, uh, slammed that down and basically put a halt to all renewable energy production, uh, very much seeing the threat that it posed to natural gas and and oil. I think the federal government here, again, I give them credit. You know, they've made big investments in battery plants. They're doing everything they can. Well, I don't want to say everything they can, because imagine if they spent $34 billion dollars on solar farms Mm -hmm. and wind farms and geothermal energy and nuclear instead of $34 billion on an oil pipeline. But they are doing some really good work around attracting investment in in renewable energy. So that is happening. You know, the federal government has put in an electrical vehicle mandate by 2035. All vehicles should be electrical in Canada, the ones that are sold. Of course, Aliyev is very unlikely to continue with that. Right. Uh, so all of this stuff is is extremely vulnerable. So no, I don't think we are we are being nearly as aggressive as we can and should be in terms of promoting renewable energy and helping workers transition. I don't want to be glib or or flippant about how easy like 150,000 jobs are not you can't just tell those guys, "Oh, why don't you just, you know, why don't you just switch over to this industry?" You know, what if someone told you, Jordan or me, Arno, like, oh, well, you're a writer. Why don't you just go into PR instead of instead of what you're instead of journalism? Like, it, right. it's, nobody really wants to just switch their industries. But here we are. You know, I, we need to do something. Given that it is what it is in Canada at the moment, are there uh, fossil fuel driven states out there that are doing better at managing this transition? And what are they doing? Well, if you look at the United States who is also producing more oil than ever, you know, they're getting while the getting's good, just like we are. But they are also investing in the energy transition at a historic level. The Inflation Reduction Act has spent hundreds of billions of dollars to promote solar, wind, nuclear, all of these things, nuclear a bit less. They've done something very close to a Green New Deal. And that, I think, is really going to cushion the blow for them. Of course, they're fighting many of the same forces. Republicans are doing everything they can to keep oil alive and and crush the energy transition. But they have invested at a scale and intensity in the United States that we in Canada have not. And I think it's a good comparison because, you know, you could look at the European Union 
And they've also made huge investments in alternative energies, and they are very aggressively decarbonizing their their economies. But none of none of those countries in Europe have as much oil and gas as as Canada does. So we are in many ways a petro state, and that makes the challenge much much more difficult. What do we need to do to take the first steps to confront this? You know, Jordan, I, I really think that just having an honest and frank conversation about the reality we're in is a huge first step that we could take. We have a political establishment that is in many ways arguing over whether climate change is even real. And I hate to be partisan, but it really is conservatives who are putting up these roadblocks and paying some lip service. Most of the time they know that they can't quite say climate change is a hoax, but they come pretty close. Justin Trudeau and the, and the federal liberals passed a, a Sustainable Jobs Act recently, and that was basically the, the new name for what was started out as the Just Transition Act, which was designed to pour funds into helping the energy industry transition. And the federal conservatives filibustered that for months. They put up about 20,000 amendments. And if you listen to what some of the MPs said it, as they were taking up space, they said, well, you know... I remember when people were worried about the hole in the ozone layer, and that turned out all right. Mm. Totally oblivious to the irony there that that was a crisis and it got solved (laughs) because the world came together to deal with it. But implying, again, that this climate change thing is, is just a passing fancy. So I really don't think we can get anywhere until every political party acknowledges the scale of the problem here. Um, There's no easy answers. There's no easy way out. I think, you know, the main point of my article that I wrote about this is that, yes, Canada relies heavily on oil, both economically and infrastructurally. So let's acknowledge that. That is the situation. Mm -hmm. Let's acknowledge that the thing that our country relies on is putting us on a collision course with almost unimaginable catastrophe. We really need to get to a place where people are competing to have the best transition plan and the most aggressive transition plan rather than trying to argue over, well, is climate change really that important? Or, well, you know, come on, Canada only produces X amount of the world's supplies, so why bother? Let's, you know, those those kinds of things are so catastrophic to to getting out of this this situation. So I really think an important place to start is is to acknowledge reality. And this episode started with such good news, Arno. I know, I didn't mean to take us from the light to the dark, but uh, the energy transition that's happening, the renewable explosion, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good things to, to, to focus on, but I think we got to hold the light and the dark equally uh, in order to navigate what's ahead. That's a fantastic way to put it. Thank you uh, so much for this, as always. Thanks, Jordan. It's great to speak with you. Arno Kopechki, writing in The Walrus. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can send us any feedback you like by writing us at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us 416-935-5935 and leaving a voicemail. The Big Story is available in every single podcast player, and it's on your smart speaker. Just ask it to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.